No, I'm not interested in interpreting flag. Mm -hmm. In investigating what did he really mean mm -hmm. by something. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in applying his ideas mm -hmm. in my research in the history of both religion and science. When I was a student of physics 40 years ago, they told me constant, constantly about the geniuses in the history mm -hmm. of physics who made great discoveries because they were geniuses. Mm -hmm. And studying the history of physics, I realized that there are no geniuses if the situation in physics is not prepared for discoveries. Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, if the situation is ready, mm -hmm. somebody makes mm -hmm. a theoretical discovery. Mm -hmm. but no genius can be ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, physics has to be understood as a collective enterprise. Mm -hmm. so. I feel like it's very important for me to get some sort of ingredients in order to sort of, um, to put it in military terms, to fight against that strong tendency in my field. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to stress the communal and collective mm -hmm. element to it. Mm -hmm. As a young scholar in the 1990s, I was uh, thinking and writing about uh, basic theoretical issues concerning writing intellectual history in general. Uh, and then I came across Ludwig Fleck in the early 90s and became really interested. So basically, my interest in Fleck is theoretical, philosophical, rather than I, I have never dealt with Fleck uh, as a historian as such, uh, really. Uh, more, more an interest, interested reader of, uh, I, I started out with the English translations and started to, to read the German original in parallel with the English text. And then I did the same with uh, the Swedish translation of uh, Entstehung und Entwicklung uh, when it was published in uh, 1997. I found uh, Fleck to be uh, this quite headstrong thinker uh, with his very uh, odd language. He invented his own language. And I felt that quite a lot was lost in translation when I compared. Uh, and uh, there were several things uh, that was lost uh, uh, when I compared the German uh, text with, with the English and the Swedish ones. Uh, for instance, uh, I thought that uh, Fleck's sense of humor uh, was lost. The playfulness, uh, 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 which has a lot to do with his message about creating a democratic reality, this message about tolerance, uh, 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 creating intellectual hubris, basically. Uh, but it also has to do with his language, his playing, his toying with words uh, in an inventive way. Uh, and that was lost both in the English and even more in the Swedish translation, actually. One of my teachers at medical school in Tel Aviv uh, was uh, one of Ludwig Fleck's friends and colleagues in, uh, at Nestiona uh, Israel Institute of Biological Research. So uh, I knew about Fleck from first hand, I mean, through my teacher, Professor Moshe Aronson. The first time I came across Fleck was a couple of years ago, and I was, and I was, I was writing my PhD thesis, and I was, and I was searching for, um, for a proper me methodology. So my thesis was on, on portraits of patients in the 19th century, and I was uh, trying to, to develop a, a proper methodology. I think, and I think you can, you can develop you know, this, this, this notion of a learning to see, to, uh, to, to think about to think about today uh, scientific methodologies. So how, how do we actually see? What do we actually perceive? And I really like uh, so Flex, Flex um, metaphors. And uh, so that was my, my talk was about uh, metaphors and Flex. So when I, when I look into the diphtheria culture, what do I actually see? What, what, um, how, how do I recognize the pathological form? And so, so our thought collective, as it were, teaches us to, to recognize um, the correct form and to distinguish it from, from another form. And that's basically, and, and, and when I was reading that for the first time, I was thinking, okay, that's, that's actually how I'm supposed to, to look, how I'm supposed to see, how, how, I'm, how I'm supposed to, to, to recognize the correct form 
in order to extract a meaning. So that was very telling for me. And, and I think you can, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, for me, it was a, it's like meta, meta theory in order to, to, to think about today's sciences and, and how these work. First of all, I, I was thinking about my um, dissertation, PhD dissertation, and it was about barbarism. And I found in some uh, textbook uh, about sociology of knowledge, uh, FLEC, and concept of proto-idea. And I thought in that moment that proto that barbarism in, is something in European um, tradition, something like uh, proto-idea, and uh, I started to think in that uh, manner, but after that, I understand that um, well. It's important to know how uh, how knowledge uh, transmission uh, and uh, well more about knowledge transfers between groups, and uh, I started to discuss about that with my colleagues and they find that useful because uh, in Serbian archaeology. Um, Nowadays, there are two paradigms in the same time, and that's the problem. And there are battles between uh, groups uh, of traditional Serbian archaeologists. They believe that they are theoretical, and they just know what they know, and you just uh, copy them, and you know what they know. And that's the problem, I believe. And well, when you need theoretical explication, that's something uh, that's different. But you know, to fa uh, you need to face it. Uh, history of uh, discipline uh, to know how to have a debate with traditional Serbian archaeology, and that's that's the status quo. That's the problem, and we need some solutions for that problem. And FLEC and Thought Collective is a perfect tool for that. Um, formerly I, I was a veterinary surgeon um, but I, I left practice because um, I became um, interested in, and driven to understand uh, problems that I encountered in practice particularly to do with the diagnosis of disease and, and methodologically how people decide on the best ways to make um, a diagnosis. So the common problems I'd, I'd encounter in, in practice was that largely the arguments people deployed for why we should diagnose disease one way rather than, than another uh, were, were very poor and many of them off but they were circular or simply absent or commit obvious fallacies like affirming the consequent and, and, and you, you know you, you can see um, those sorts of structures and, I, and that was quite distressing actually so you're trying to make decisions based on really very poor argumentation um, and trying to understand why why that is. Um, a, as a veterinary surgeon I was um, reading some philosophy to try and wrap my head around why this was happening and the first person I, I read was actually uh, Henri Poincaré and his conventionalism was actually very helpful. Oh, there are some. But part of the difficulty with, with, with Poincaré is um, he, he's still relying on, on, a, um, on what he calls crude facts and, the, and what he calls the universal invariant. So there's still um, aspects that he thinks are just given to us by uh, sense experience from the world. And I couldn't develop a, a solid account of that. That wasn't, I didn't, that didn't appear to be the, um, the case. And I, I, I went, um, to, to do a history MSc at, at Imperial College in UCL and at, there I was introduced to Ludwig Fleck and Fleck's work um, is, seemed to be to be picking up many of the important themes from Poincaré but then improving on them so it was, it was a superior epistemology in, from, from, my, from my perspective because it didn't rely on, on crude facts, nothing was a given and yet we could still speak about um, things that resisted our will and therefore objective knowledge. Although Fleck doesn't like that terminology, but you know. yeah, my field of interest is Hopper's, the so-called history of philosophy of science area, and uh, with special focus on uh, the Vienna Circle and philosophy of science in the interwar period, and it's obviously it's obvious that we read Fleck as well, and it was uh, pretty soon that I found this exchange with Bilikevich. And then I got interested in uh, his own book to understand the background of his views in this uh, short debate. There was a quantum revolution in physics in the 1920s. And there was a German journal, Die Naturwissenschaften. And there was a, deb a, a, a debate at this time with both physicists and philosophers taking part in the debate. Uh, you know, it was a debate about 
the meaning, the consequences, the nature of what is going on in physics in 1920s. <coughs> and Fleck all the time followed this, this discussion. And this was probably the source of his uh, theory. Not his microbiology, but the quantum revolution in physics. Kuhn suggests that it is an individual scientist who formulates a new style of thinking. And this opinion of Kuhn contradicts what Fleck claims in his book, because according to Fleck, it is not possible for an individual to make extraordinary research, not governed by any rules. Fleck says that our thinking is shaped, is very strongly conditioned by what, he inherit, what we inherited of, from others. And it is not possible for an, in, for an individual to change this socially you, you know, developed and accepted thought style. A style implies a compelling element, a co cognitive compulsion that leads the members of a certain collective in a particular direction in excluding alternatives. Flagg gives even a hint of how that compulsory element comes to the fore, namely by coloring, that's a quote, coloring concepts, which means that the thought compulsion, Stilgermesa Denkzwang in German, is based on a conceptual element, a particular usage of terms, phrases, and expressions. Then we have the creation of a readiness or disposition to see things in a particular way. The style even dictates flag holes in which way the seeing develops and gets actualized. One could also say that the transcendental element forms a certain expectation for particular results along the process of scientific work. And finally, there is a collective mood, flag says, a non-cognitive atmosphere among the participants of the collective, while mood does obviously not mean the personal temper and reign, but an intellectual taste and a notion of what counts as good result and appropriate way to it. All three elements allow for the possibility of the change of style. The next solution is, as you probably know, that new style of thinking can, can be developed by a community as a result of a series of misunderstandings be, be, between people. Because everybody of, belongs at once to different thought collectives, so we never understand each other perfectly, and in a series of such misunderstandings, we can arrive at a new style of thinking as a product of a collective, but not of an, in, of an individual thing. <coughs> <clears throat> but not of an individual scientist. Hey, now. Uh, Flick, Flick didn't do intellectual history, including stuff like uh, the political philosophy Quentin Skinner deals with, for instance. He was a theorist of science, wasn't he? Well, really? Are you sure about that? I would actually say that what one of the main problems with reading uh, Fleck in the shadow of uh, Thomas Kuhn uh, is uh, uh, that uh, uh, much of the literature tends to shrink uh, Fleck into th uh, uh, a theorist of science, of Naturwissenschaft. Well, he's actually a theorist in, of thought in general and actually claims to be a theorist of thought quite explicitly in general. But what was the point of comparing <laughs> within a Fagleisch and the Erkenntnis theory? I would say that a main point for Fleck was to bring down science to earth uh, as a mode of thinking among others. A very good, a very interesting form of mo mode of thinking. He was quite positive to it, but uh, bring it down. Uh, and um, a crucial point, I would say, is now that most Fleckian core concepts apply to other forms of thinking as well. That Fleck tried to go beyond the science yeah. to think on general way of thinking. My interpretation is 
that he learned it from Sigmund Kramstig, who used very much the same approach to analyze daily examples, to analyze how doctor thinks. You hear at Kramstig a lot. And I think that, uh, yeah, so I think that, <coughs> the is that not that he was not a thinker about science, he was proposed a specific reading of science as activity integrated in the world and that cannot be separated from other way of thinking and doing, which is exactly his revolution, in my opinion, his revolutionary aspect was to show there is nothing so special about science. And there are two, I mean, two extreme poles. The one says he's a, they, they stress more the realistic elements in his mm -hmm. work and others uh, think that he's a constructivist. Mm -hmm. And I think both is wrong, uh, but there are reasons for being wrong. And what I try to do, I mean, when I sort of should uh, comment on my own paper, is that um, the, the, the proposal to read him in a transcendental way is a very good tool to combine the particular vary of both extremes without the confusion and, and pitfalls that both have. Mm. So that you can see, well, there, there are constructive, or let's put it that way, creative elements mm. in, his, uh, in his thinking and in his work. And yet there is a, uh, a common ground that is sort of um, constituted by language um, and by symbols mm -hmm. and a sort of a common mood of mm -hmm. thinking. And then you can have it both ways and uh, both ways and you don't have to exclude mm -hmm. one or the other. So that, that was probably the, yeah. the, the basic idea. For Fleck, no facts are simply true because of the way the world is. No facts are simply discovered. So we have something of a problem. On the one hand, there are those who latch on to Fleck's claim that all knowledge is historically contingent and invented, and others latch on to the claim that the passive elements of knowledge resist our will and are not any way we wish them to be and are thus discovered. So several scholars like Harwood and Stump and John Wetterstern and Marcus Sedell, Thomas Schneller, Hank van der Belt and Bart Gremmen have claimed that Fleck cannot have it both ways and that thus he must contradict himself by saying that knowledge is both historically contingent and yet not fully determined by historical, social, and cultural factors. Last slide. If Fleck is read as a conventionalist, then I think these problems disappear. So I, Professor Sadie, I think, has, has suggested at least that Fleck's active element of knowledge uh, can be seen to correspond with Poincaré's principles or conventions, and so perhaps Fleck's passive elements of knowledge might correspond to uh, a conventionalist scientific facts or laws. In conventionalism, conventions are necessary for the production of scientific facts, but they're not sufficient. And this is because after we adopt a certain set of conventions, what we then experience is imposed upon us, so say conventionalists. And I think this can be understood with an analogy of pushing on a wall. So if the wall is taken to be the world as it is in itself, if we wish to feel um, the resistance from the wall, we have to push on it. Yeah, it requires our activity to feel that resistance. And how we push on the wall affects how the wall pushes back. So if I, if I push harder on the wall, it pushes back on me harder. But although how we push on the wall is up to us, and how the wall pushes back, so, sorry, so although how we push on the wall is up to us, how the wall pushes back on us, given how we've pushed on it, is not up to us. So if I want to push this hard on the wall, the wall doesn't fall over. Yeah, and no matter how much I want it to, it, it won't, it doesn't. This isn't up to me. Yeah. And Fleck is very clever um, in, in this, because he's realized that in order to speak of this passive resistance, we don't actually have to talk about the wall. Yeah. So passive resistance corresponds to the resultant force from the wall. I can talk about my activity. I can talk about how I'm resisted. I don't need to speak about the world as it is in itself. He thinks that's an unintelligible idea, so that's just as well. To understand why it is we adopt certain active associations, it's useful to take a longer historical view. And this is very much what he does in his first chapter in explaining how we define syphilis today. Um, to, to account for how it is um, that we've come to understand and, and see in a certain way. And once we understand that, um, this enables us uh, to, to take 
to, to criticise the knowledge that we've received from, from our forebears and it, when we understand why it is that we have received it the way that we have. And I think Fleck actually captures this quite nicely with his comment that who would teach anatomy without teaching embryology? Yeah, and I think this is, in, this is why if we, if we are not teaching medicine aligned with its history, that's what we're doing. And that we're, we're trying to teach current medical knowledge as if it's just given to us by looking the way the world is. Um, but it's not, it has long histories, long lineages, which, so it could have been different and we could have been experienced things differently. And we, if we want to be aware of the active associations we bring to medicine, then I think using history is a very powerful tool to do that. Each knowledge is the monad. It's, it's, it's atomized. It doesn't, well, you can't sum it up with, with, the other, with the other kind. And now, um, <coughs> the question which have to be raised here is the question, do we live in the same world, right? According to Kant, it is possible because our knowledge is universal. We live in a, the world of the same episteme. If there is no one general universal episteme, the question is, do we live in the same, same world, right? The knowledge to be a knowledge must be pluralistic, atomized, and scattered. This is very important, right? Knowledge to be a knowledge can't be universal. This is the most important uh, assumption here. And now, if we agree with this, we, we are in a trouble. I would use the Leszek Kowakowski uh, 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 expression. This is kind of a metaphysical horror. Why? Because if it's true that uh, there, are, there is no one episteme, right? Every, every, uh, everybody lives in a different world, right? We, we, don't, we live in a world of the same co thought collective. But w there is no one word, right? We live in a different way, way, uh, word because we perceive word in a different ways. Um, a long time ago, I gave a little paper on a con in a conference on uh, anti-Semitism, and I tried to read Flex monograph as a, a voice against anti-Semitism. And uh, later, I didn't pursue that uh, paper any further because I myself wasn't that convinced, I ever thought it was probably a bit far-fetched, but the starting point was that uh, Hitler himself, he, he brings uh, civilists together with, uh, with, with Jews, and so, so my, my take was that uh, this emphasis on, on, on scientific developments, on the, just the history, and, 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 and bringing it together also with social development, could, see, uh, could be seen as a kind of an, enlightening ar argument uh, to basically also so this educative purpose that you just depicted uh, with with this uh, circle uh, so do you think it is too far-fetched to read the monograph in such a way or do you think it could it would be fruitful well i think it would be fruitful because it's obvious that we have like other jewish positions in the time in the time to uh, act to very aware of anti-Semitism and they have to deal with it on an everyday basis as teachers, as professionals, and um, it was simply unavoidable that the that uh, and his colleagues were concerned with anti-Semitism and as they showed, um, they also took active part in trying to counteract it by uh, whatever means possible. So I do not think that it would be overreading uh, to try to see uh, that writing from this perspective as well. It totally makes sense to me. The general strategy of flag, uh, maybe this is an answer for, 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 for uh, your question. Uh, when uh, Fleck was writing, there, there were no sociologists of science, sociologists of scientific knowledge. Uh, there were only philosophers of science. So, uh, wanted to write, uh, wanting to write something about science, he had to address uh, it to philosophers of science. That's why he wrote about fact, about uh, discovery, about. Uh, observation about uh, objectivity. So these very classical 
the concepts of philosophy of science. And what, is, uh, what he is doing it in his text, he is not deconstructing these concepts, but he is reconstructing these concepts with use of various metaphors. And one of the most important groups of metaphors are metaphors from uh, Gestalt uh, Psychology. I think this is the, the most important group. What could could you say something uh, that this is discovery, the Gestalt? Uh, the, the <laughs> the, this is crazy, yes, for philosophers of science. Uh, so he is using various metaphors from uh, Gestalt Psychology, but also from physics to reconstruct the classical uh, philosophical concepts and in effect, in an effect, I think, he wants to replace these concepts by his uh, thought style and uh, thought collective and, uh, and so on. So he wa what I think what he wanted to do, he wanted to create a new uh, discipline of, of science, a meta science. That's uh, right. Uh, what David uh, said, he, he didn't want to restrict uh, it to science, but to uh, create new discipline of science about thinking, about devil, development of thinking. Because this is development of thinking. This is the proper uh, subject of, of his theory, I think. Yeah, maybe. Um, what attracted me was then uh, when I was discussing in my mind the, the, the problems, uh, theoretical problems, meta methodological problems in writing the history of thought in general. Uh, and I saw the possibilities in this theory. And uh, from my point of view, a major point was then that this theory is what so many have tried to do with Thomas Kuhn, namely to take this theory from a narrow place of uh, theory of science, not in the sense of naturalwissenschaften, uh, and to transpose it to other contexts where it doesn't really work. Uh, and what I found is so interesting with Fleck was that he, in the outset, uh, created his theory in a way that it should be applicable in so many fields. It's possible to study archaeology. <laughs> uh, Kuhn would resist if the, he, he, uh, he had a problem with all the usages of, of the uh, paradigm. So I have th th this hope about Brazil or about Serbia because they are trying to apply Fleck. Like, <laughs> following Fleck's thinking translation always includes transformation as it transposes a certain style of thinking as expressed in a particular language into expressions provided by the language the original text should be translated into. As a rule, translators seek to translate most adequately, but what does adequately mean? On what level should adequacy be measured, the level of single words, phrases, or maybe on the basis of a holistic meaning and its genre transposed into the respective habits, into the culture, using the language the text is translated into? So it eminently shaped the Anglo-Saxon reception, but it also affected the subsequent re reception in other languages. He was uh, bilingual. Uh, he expressed one theory in two languages. He did it simultaneously and he did not self-translate. It has, he did not translate, for instance, a paper published in German into Polish, but he wrote original texts in both of these languages. So Polish and German expressions of the theory of, are equally authentic. It means that when we translate between Polish and German texts, we translate between two original languages. And when we translate his theory into a third language, we translate from two original languages. Now I, I 
can show you one example uh, uh, of a passage where when uh, where flag use legitimierung uh, and in uh, in the middle there is this is a polish translation and uh, the right column this is uh, american uh, one uh, legitim legitimation is an expression that uh, flag used uh, both in polish and in german and it was variously translated from german to polish consistent but consistently translated from Polish to German. Uh, so when one expresses uh, uh, one's thoughts, it, uh, its form depends on the aim of the speaker and on, of the no on the knowledge of the receiver. If one talks to a layman, this is a form of popularization. If one talks to those who, whose knowledge is more or less the same as his, this is information. And legitimation is the third part of the sequence. We could say that the, the third ta target, target audience here is the thought collective. So legitimation is a justification of our thoughts in regard to the current status of the thought style. It's simply part of the game called science as uh, knowledge. In order to become scientific, uh, a knowledge has to be legitimized. But if one wants to legitimize his or her findings, he or she has to use terms ex and expressions delivered by the existing body of knowledge. So he or she has to relate it to the existing theories and accepted facts. And this task is misleadingly called confirmation here in, in the American translation. And the question why flag gets translated at which time it was in Italian is 83? In 83, 83. The, first, uh, yeah. it, uh, the first translation after the English translation. Yeah, it's only for Polish, which mm -hmm. is fascinating. No, from, from German. From German, yeah. You see, I, mm -hmm. I didn't prefer to translate it from German. The English translation was there. Yeah. So, I mean, I would actually then start exactly with, the, with this question, why did you translate Fleck at the certain moment you translated Fleck? It was, you know, yeah. so it's, you know, mm -hmm. you can okay. move. But, but uh, Fleck was translated, the book for, by Fleck was translated because uh, uh, Rossi, Rossi was an historian uh, of science, uh, an Italian historian of science, uh, but is well known uh, in the English speaking world was interested in uh, promoting uh, the idea that history of science uh, uh, was needing an, improve, an improved methodology. And uh, he was impressed, uh, indeed, uh, by Kuhn. In reading Kuhn, uh, he remarked uh, this uh, uh, note referring to, uh, to Fleck. And uh, after this, uh, and uh, for in the following years, uh, Fleck was published in a German text by Zorkamp in, uh, in Germany. And this way, the idea by Rossi was to uh, publish a, a translation directly from the German text because uh, the English test uh, wa was unsatisfactory in uh, many regards. Uh, and uh, I was uh, interested with the translation. And the work uh, uh, was interesting for me and uh, uh, easy, because I was well acquainted with the German, also German debate and uh, with the terminology the scientific terminology, and Italian too, the uh, Italian language, uh, is uh, adapted to uh, translate the, some uh, German words uh, with, um, with uh, some uh, construction, uh, with some, uh, in many cases, uh, with the philosophical language, uh, Italian philosophical language, uh, that during the 19th, 19th century was important from Germany. I, I think then the, trans, the fact that 
flag should be translated in, uh, in French was promoted by Ilana Lovry a lot. And um, then, so it was in during the, the 90s and the, I think she managed to convince uh, a publisher to, to do an necessary uh, and this publisher had a collection in history of science. Um, a friend of, uh, of hers and uh, was also the director of this collection. So um, they all together they managed to, uh, to, uh, to push the, pro the project forward. But the, the limitation was really because they didn't find a translator. So basically I was uh, like, uh, they, they bought I think the right to, for the translations for 10 years and uh, they, they were we were, we were not that many years left when I started myself the translations. But I think this is the story. This, the story is Ilana Lovey, who knows Fleck well and who is really uh, knows Fleck, and uh, really she wanted to have this, translate, uh, this text translated into French. And it was also uh, needed because um, it, it was. It's not, it was not known as Canguilhem, as of a thinker of medicines or, sci uh, or, uh, or um, science in, uh, in France, but still within the, within the French world of historian and philosopher of medicine, at least, uh, Fleck was known and used and taught, especially in medical schools. So um, the, the translation was also needed for that, and if they managed to find a publisher, it was also with the argument that um, it, with uh, the argument that the, there will be a large public for it, uh, because uh, all the, the new doctors and the new uh, would uh, have to buy it and to read it, which happened in fact because the, the translation where the book was published as a big book quite. Not expensive, but rather extensive, and then it was it was published again three years later into a very cheap uh, book and um, a, a very cheap paper of books because in fact uh, every medical student first year medical students buy it has to buy it and read it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really the story behind it, but I think uh, without Ilana Lewis' efforts and some others' efforts maybe the, the translation would not be done in French. So it was really framed into the history of medicine rather than general history of science? Yes, but after that it found its way into mm. other, uh, other places. But I think it was, it was only more, in France at least, the people who would know it were uh, people uh, interested in the uh, history of medicine and philosophy of medicine. And in fact, it was uh, first published in the collections uh, uh, interested, uh, which was called uh, medicine and society, mm -hmm. and it was really the public was really historians and philosophers of med and sociologists of medicines for this collection. Well, I think it's a very important question, and uh, it has flecken grounds on this question because it's about the circulation of books, circulation of ideas. And when it's formulated this way, uh, politics of translations, it implies a decision. Mm. Um, I think um, I'm, I, I was part of this team that, um, that is responsible for a very recent translation. And unfortunately, it wasn't part of, uh, of a political decision and of translations. It was rather a, um, uh, a kind of a collective effort, of course, but uh, a small one. It started um, Mauro Conde, who will be speaking tomorrow. He, um, together with uh, also Ilana Lovi in, in Brazil, she uh, has uh, PhD students and uh, they are mainly responsible for the circulation of Flag's name in, in Brazilian uh, um, um, academic uh, area and they contact us, uh, Georg Ote and me. Um, first they tried, um, Mauro tried uh, bigger um, editors, publishers, 
but we they couldn't find and it was no part of a research or uh, nor part of a something done in the university or in a foundation it was more um, some people trying to uh, with small publishers um, trying to uh, go on with this and to get it published so um, Yes, it was in 2010, so six years ago. And in those six years before, we hardly uh, have seen Fleck in the, uh, in the papers, in, and now his name cir uh, circulates much more. Uh, at the beginning, always attached with Kuhn's name, but I think it's starting to be unattached, naturally. And you were the second version? Are you planning Sorry? already a second edition? I think it would be nice, especially after this conference. I have several ideas about a, for a good revision. I think revisions are part of a, mm. part of our job. It's I, not always the editors and the publishers they understand the importance of a good revision and how uh, translations are part of the history. That mm. sometimes they have to be updated. They have to change some things, adapt some things. Not always the publishers have this. Uh, um, it's most most commonly translation is um, underestimated as a just uh, just a translation. Yes, thank you. Invisible. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. yeah. it's invisible work. Invisible and the, the more skills. the more the translators are invisible, they usually think the better <laughs> the translation is. Uh, it took me uh, almost three years to complete the translations of a book and I was only working part time of it but I also needed pauses because uh, it was uh, very uh, complicated. And um, I, often, I often thought I would never finish it and the, third, uh, the fourth chapter often sounded to me just impossible to translate. Really the fourth one was really a nightmare. What I would like to stress here is that a translation of text such as Flex book should be a teamwork, as it was, for instance, in the, in the well, it should be a teamwork, uh, as it was in the Brazilian, uh, the Portuguese Brazilian translations, where different skills should be brought together. To be alone, it's really a tough task. And uh, the translation was made under privileged circumstances. I only mentioned the good things, uh, due to the fact that our team had native speakers of both the source and the target language. Now, after hearing Pavel, I think it's not that privileged since we didn't have a uh, Polish. Polish speaker. Um, but well, we used to joke that Fleck, as someone who wrote so much about the collective, would have certainly approved our method. Such privilege allowed us, for example, to make use of the Sprachgefühl in both languages and seek for equivalence in the terms we use. However, it also required considerable agreement among us in the establishment of a work dynamic that revolved around the document's needs. Our terminology, database, our glossary was built collectively, which involved preliminary discussions before taking decisions. Did you use uh, American translation to support your work? Or? Yeah, this was also um, a discussion we decided not to read them before. <laughs> uh, after we finished the translation, we read the, 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 the American edition. Yeah, but great before, laugh. We, uh, we decided not to. Today in Brazil, we didn't have a lot of people interested in discourse, philosophy, theoretical, but we have this kind of people, but uh, in, in generally, they uh, try to use flag like a tool to understand some problems in science education to improve the quality of teaching in science uh, or to uh, research in history of medicine. This uh, we have a lot of uh, papers and dissertations uh, that uh, was. Uh, wrote in flex, based in flex uh, works.
The concept of Denkverkehr uh, is a very good example. So let's consider Denkverkehr. Uh, in the English translations, both uh, in, in the translation of Genesis and Development of a Scientific Fact and in the anthology Cog Cognition and Fact, uh, the term Denkverkehr is generally trans rendered as communication. But does that make sense? If, if Fleck meant communication, why didn't he write uh, communication? In German, it's such a common word. Uh, it was a deliberate choice, obviously, to avoiding speaking about uh, communication. Uh, and I mean, Denkverkehr. Verkehr is an interesting term in German. Uh, it means both traffic and intercourse. Uh, for instance, it's used in the term Geschlechtsverkehr, sexual in intercourse. Uh, so, so <laughs> and traffic in the normal sense of trains and buses and stuff like that. Uh, so, so, and, and I actually think that uh, both dimensions of that term are used in Fleck's uh, argument. He's speaking about traffic in words, uh, in linguistic expressions. And he's speaking about uh, uh, intercourse between people who are doing intellectual work. Uh, uh, and that was a part of the, the, the quote I started with, actually. The traffic in words and the intercourse between thinking people. Uh, and now it's quite interesting that the Swedish translation in this respect is much, much better than the English one. Uh, and the Swedish translator's choice was tankeutbyte, which basically means thought exchange. So, so th that is workable. But th th there is actually a slight problem there, because Fleck toying with words is also speaking about Gedankenaustausch. And that's the immediate, the literal counterpart of Tankeutbyte in Swedish. So the, those variations in language are lost in translation now. The case of circulation of thoughts clearly shows that translating flag is not only a challenge but also an opportunity. An opportunity to better understand flag and an opportunity to better translate his text into a third language. Contextual analysis, analysis of frequency and stable attributives shows that the German Denkverkehr, despite the obvious meaning differences, is the very same concept as Polish Krążenie Myśli. In the existing translations, the former is translated usually as Wymiana Myśli, which is other Polish expression, and the latter <coughs> is translated as Gedankenkreislauf, which is invented by translators. The discussion about, for example, Denkverkehr and the idea of, because we translated Denk, the, the morphine Denk, as uh, now, pensamento. Uh, and I think some, it's interesting to think, maybe we could use the verb in infinitive for some of the expressions. For example, Kolektiv de Pensar, I don't, it doesn't sound bad to me. Uh, for example, Denkverkehr, uh, we used, um, something more like traffic of thoughts. We were the other extreme of the English tendency. We, were, we chose a very concrete uh, word. And circulation, I think, now knowing that for, uh, in Polish it also suits with the, the Polish version of the concept, I think circulation of circulação de pensamento sounds good to me. Circulação de pensar, infinitive verb, then it sounds, uh, it sounds hard, it sounds hard for Portuguese speakers. Communication never occurs without the transformation, with intercollectively right the fundamental alteration. So Fleck used the neutral term transformation and alteration and not the more positively connoted term of innovation. So circulation of idea is a creative process. And the imperfect translation are creating talent, but they don't, but the creation is not necessarily progressive. But production and circulation of scientific fact has practical consequences. So they, this is the important point, when it has practical consequences. He was a doctor and a public health expert. I 
groups wanted to say that uh, Flag obviously used this neutral uh, for, for uh, uh, expression transformation, but not always, because in Polish uh, texts he he also used to to write about uh, garbling. How? Garbling. How in, in, in Polish this is przejnaczenie. Przejnaczenie. This is not... Czas uh, mutaś? I think that the best uh, English equivalent is garbling. Uh, uh, he, he, he not, not always used this neutral form of transformation. Yeah. He used also uh, a bit negative. There is Flack holds an internal conservatism within a cluster of opinion, a resistance to change up to the point of a harmony of deception, harmony der Täuschung. Hence, one cannot make up facts or the way there, since the loyalty to nature is nothing but the loyalty to the culture we are part of. That's almost a quote. You see, in the case of physics and of mathematics, for example, all translations are perfect. If I take an original textbook in physics in English or in Russian and I have its Polish translation, both books say exactly the same. Why? Because physicists are using artificial sublanguages, especially developed for their purposes. And those sublanguages are strictly, are strictly equivalent. If you want to use ordinary Swedish or ordinary Polish or ordinary French in your translation, you have to accept that no translation can be perfect. So, because there are no counterparts in ordinary languages, strict counterparts. So yes, I agree, but uh, the specificity of Ludwig Flack's legacy is that we have two original formulations of the same theory. So we can check whether he used krążenie myśli or ruchawka myślowa, and we, uh, we can prove that he chose, uh, he used to choose uh, uh, krążenie myśli. Uh, and that's, that's an opportunity. If we thereafter look into the terminology around, around Widerstand, we are now tempted again not to associate it with a, with a socio-political meaning like we might have in the case of collective, but again with physics, resistance like in electricity or in mechanics. When you're discussing, we, we, when you're talking about translations, a lot of the effort today in this discussion has gone into choice of different possible words. Um, but like for, I only read for like in, in, um, in the English, but when I'm trying to understand what he's doing with Peter Stanza, Jesus, it's a signal of resistance. Is, it, is, is, that, is that how you, you do it in English? I, almost the words you're choosing are not the most important thing. It's what he seems to be trying to do with the words. He's always got an example in mind. He's trying to explain something or label a particular effect that he's been pointing to often for pages. Is, is Peter Stanza being a signal of, a signal of resistance? Is this? What does this mean in English? Reader stands a visa. This well, you tell me. <laughs> so, how do you translate it? A visa of yeah. resistance. Signal of resistance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's a signal of resistance. So, this is so he uses this in the context of um, the Wasserman reaction as it, as it changes from its early form, which is unintelligible to people later. But there's some signal there which Wasserman has an idea, or there's something there we can make some use of this, and they're gradually making it stronger and stronger until you end up with something that's full bodied resistance. This is the context of use. The more, so the more important thing to me seems to be getting that story correct, uh, capturing that story rather than worrying about the word necessarily. Yeah, visa of resistance uh, appears uh, in the very first stage of discovery. Yeah. yeah. So this is probably this is connected with this densification. And Fleck, I think, is not necessarily a discussion of what words should, how should we translate those words but rather a discussion of what is he trying to tell us through, through that chapter. Which is unclear with Peter Stanz at least. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the question is, the quest, you, can, you can reconstruct, the, the, at least I, I, I would say so. Um, you, can, 
interpret the the context of uh, what or, or just what he wants to achieve with that with that term or in, in that situation you can you can it's open to interpretation. I mean, uh, if you say signal of resistance, is that you signal a certain resistance that you observe? Uh, like the, the signal is signaling a certain resistance, or is the signal uh, saying you have to resist, which would be an aviso? In, I mean, the aviso is, is, is not used uh, in, in, in German language anymore, I would say. But if you look into the, in, in, into, uh, the history of the term, you would find things like the, the boat, etc. But also, it is a kind of a, a, a notification to do something. So is it is it is it is it an imperative the the the, the Widerstandsavise or is it more um, the, the, a statement of a certain state? <laughs> I'm thinking about Pavel's uh, distinction between uh, the constitutional terms and the coincidental terms, and uh, speaking about Widerstandsavise and Nicholas' point here. Uh, I'm thinking, would it be possible to speak about terminology that are central in uh, the sense of being a part of the, representing the premises of flex argument and uh, terms that are used making conclusions. And I would suppose that the term Widerstandsaviso is a part of quite a complex conclusion he's trying to, to make. Uh, in contrast to terms like Denkstil, Denkkollektiv, Denkverkehr, uh, they are part of the premise of the argument. Uh, and then I would say that such terms that are part of the premise of the argument would be important to get right as far as, far as possible. And then, for instance, in Swedish, I would claim that we're lucky that we have some precedents for using the dots over the A. Uh, <laughs> and in Natalie's case, she feels that in French, it's impossible to do the same thing that I think is actually possible uh, without being too strange in Swedish. Uh, but in, in the case of terms that are uh, 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 parts of quite complex parts of the argument being conclusions, uh, as in the case with the Vidish and I think your point is very important. Mm -hmm. The important thing is to get the argument correct. And you might use the German term in bracket, perhaps. And uh, uh, the, the, the important thing is, is to get flex mode of reasoning, actually. Um, uh, Jan started out with, with saying we haven't spoken about uh, the reader. <laughs> uh, I think part of my presentation was my experience as a reader of flex texts in three languages. And one of the things that I felt that meant what was missing in translation that was very much was Martina was speaking about the sense of humor uh, and the playfulness of the text. That, that uh, is lost in the American translation uh, due to the fact that this text actually, uh, I think you might agree, became a paraphrase mm -hmm. of the German text. Uh, uh, I would like to mention one thing about the Widerstands visa. <laughs> that was already too much based on what uh, David uh, said, I, um, my personal opinion is that uh, I would translate it um, into Portuguese. I think uh, Synology Resistance, the Portuguese translation is also not so clear, could also mean uh, resistance in um, material resistance, psychological resistance, um, could have also this big range um, and if I leave the word in the original language, it's like a rock in the middle of the text. The reader will stop there and will have to 
will at least stop, even if he knows some German. And I'm not sure if that uh, Fleck wanted this for this word. If yeah. a, a, a translator decides to leave something untranslated, uh, it has to have a purpose or cause an effect. For example, with the Latin words that Fleck uses, um, this is a decision of, of the publisher. So, so, so what is called a fact is, is a Widerstandsaviso, which pushes against the flickering chaos of, of, of images, which is thinking, right? until it emerges directly as, as a recognizable Gestalt. So, so not form, as the English translation has it. Um, and, and which the members of the collective must treat as a fact existing outside of uh, um, and independent of them. And there are, of course, um, levels of, of, of resistance, of, of, of Widerstand. So one related to the inner logic of, of the thought collective and the other related to that which is immediately perceived. And then again, the English text initially translates, uh, translates uh, Widerstands Aviso as a feeble, feeble advice. But the meaning uh, of Aviso is, as I mentioned, much more multifaceted. So, so it comes close to this, uh, to, to it means advice and notice, of course. But then again, in, it, can, it can mean gunboat, which I, which I find very interesting. At, and uh, in music, it describes this upbeat movement. And I think it is really interesting to think uh, Widerstands Aviso in this Gestalt uh, psycho in the context of Gestalt psychology, because the Gestalt psychology very often um, um, speaks about music, right? So Gestalt, and, uh, so so the first question that Ehrenfeld is asking: What is a melody? What what does a melody consist of? Um, and if we and if we transfer Widerstands Aviso to, to this Gestalt psychology context, um, we we get another layer of Widerstands Aviso, right? So it, is, it becomes an upbeat movement. It becomes a multisensorial image, uh, which is being formed in the battle of other images. Um, though we can see how these ideas can help us understand the passive as, 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 as achieving a form of objectivity. Poincaré points out, or at least highlights, that the status of being true apart from the knower and being true because the knower wishes it to be are separate, they're distinct. It's perfectly possible for something to be true, to not be true apart from us, and yet for it not to be true because we wish it to be. Yeah? And that's the state of this passive reaction. It doesn't exist unless we do something. Yeah? And it changes as we do things. So, it changed, so the passive resistance can change with our culture. And yet, it's not as we'd wish it to be. Yeah? It's not entirely determined by us. So if it changes with our culture, it's historically contingent. But because it resists our will and isn't quite how we'd want it to be, at the very least it's not subjective. And if it's not subjective, perhaps we can call it objective. If we, if we start thinking about objectivity not as corresponding to the world as it is in itself, and instead think about things that are objective as things that resist our will, I think we can have it both ways, quite coherently. We can think about knowledge as both invented and discovered, entirely historically contingent, um, and yet perfectly objective. And now, how it is, right? So, if the subject is not tied to an object, doesn't depend on object, because the interpretation is not based on things in themselves, right? There is no connection between interpretation and the object. We've, we've got just the interpretation, so something which is dependent on the subject. If we've got subject, the question is if the subject is completely free. And the answer, everybody knows here, it's, it's not free because it's tied to collective, right? The, the collective is a, um, is, a, how you, how you, is a resistance, right? This is your word, right? Not the object resist, but the, sub, the collective is the resistance for, for the, uh, for the subject. If I understood you correctly, um, you're saying that the resistance because the object blocks away and we have this interpretation, we have the subject, the resistance derives entirely from the collective, as you're reading and Fleck? Yes. I think that's supportable by some of the, I mean, I maybe didn't labour this, I think that's supportable from some of the things he says, but I think other things he says doesn't support that. Because, I mean, I, th I think he often talks about the resistance derived from the collective being explicable in terms of history, in terms of culture, in terms of psychology. 
but then he does often, well, a few times at least, um, say that there are um, there is a resistance which is not explicable in those terms. That's additional to it, and he, he doesn't. I think part of the difficulty is he doesn't want to talk about what's doing the resisting because he doesn't think that makes any sense. This makes this is probably why he's hard to read. But there, I, 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 I keep seeing in him, which is what I find most interesting about him, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. this resistance, which is additional to the one we supply ourselves, which is additional to the one the collective supplies. Mm -hmm. um, which is, it's it's mysterious, but it's there. Mm -hmm. He wants to focus on it. Going, it's definitely there. But I, I I agree with you. He definitely sometimes says um, the resistance is entirely derived from the collective, but sometimes he doesn't. I think this is where he's inconsistent. I don't know how you feel about that. Mm -hmm. you're reading mm -hmm. Are you tired? <laughs> Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much to the organisers. I'm really very grateful for the chance to speak with you all. I'm also very grateful to the organisers for providing some English weather. That <laughs> makes me feel very much at home. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. question. You'll have one. Me? Yeah, I always have some. <laughs> I don't understand the problem. You don't understand the problem, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I can't explain myself. No, no, I think it's very right. I just, I don't understand the problem because I'm not a philosopher. So that's, it's not because of you, it's because of me, of course. Oh, I doubt that very much. So you want me to explain the problem? No, no, no I don't understand something. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Yes, yes. No, but uh, I see the paradox that if you want to introduce a philosopher, in another language, may, may be French or Portuguese, then you have to uh, obey closely the, 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 the language you want to translate it into. So it sounds beautiful, as you said, because you want to lure people in, you want to seduce them to read the stuff. And then when they read the stuff, then they get uh, you know, excited and then they, then they realize, well, but that's that's not really well translated, and so so. But it's interesting to compare, like to Kant. As Kant had a, a, a deliberate purpose uh, to be dull, uh, in order not to flatter the reader, not not to seduce the reader by his beautiful language. So so <laughs> his way of being boring is deliberate. And I would say that Flake's playfulness uh, and his toying with words uh, it, it is in a simple way a key part of the argument, but it makes it quite attractive, I, I think. And when I'm reading in German, I'm laughing, and I'm not laughing when I'm, I'm reading in, in English or in Swedish.